Welcome everybody to the second part of today's Referentenbesprechung, where I will address a topic that is a recurrent one. It is about the nature of the EU and more precisely its um, statute under international law, but also under domestic law. And um, the, the reason why we discuss this is that we have a first post-Brexit diplomatic incident that is exactly related to this issue, namely the diplomatic status of EU envoys and the EU diplomatic representation in London. And while the EU argues that the EU is obviously more than an international organization and deserves a specific treatment, the UK puts forward well that the EU is less than a state and therefore also deserves a different treatment than a state. Let me provide you with some background information. Now, on the 1st of January 2021, the trade and cooperation agreement between the EU and the UK provisionally entered into force. And this was kind of the ceiling of the EU Brexit divorce. And shortly after, on the 21st of January, it became public that the UK refused to accord the EU envoy that had been um, nominated as a head of delegation, Joao Valle de Almeida, the diplomatic credentials usually accorded to the representative of a state. And the same is true for the diplomatic mission, or that is to say the staff of that um, um, representation. You see the building of here on the slide. The UK also said, well, as the EU is not a state, neither the ambassador nor the staff of that representation is entitled to a protection equivalent to that of a state or of state representatives. And the UK said they cannot grant these privileges and immunities because that would be a precedent. And this precedent would in turn invite other international organizations to claim the same privileges and immunities than the EU. And the EU was all but amused and said that this would run counter a quite well-established practice, namely that the EU is treated like a state around the world Uh, in most, actually in all of the host states where it has these diplomatic missions, and that therefore this is unacceptable. And you will have understood that this is not only a matter of law, it is also a matter of uh, a signal, a diplomatic signal. And this was well encapsulated by a declaration made by Joseph Borrell, the EU's High Representative for Foreign Affairs, when he spoke to the press after um, a Foreign Affairs Council meeting on the 25th of January, where he said, and I'm quoting, it is not a friendly signal, the first one that the United Kingdom has sent to us after, immediately after leaving the European Union. If things have to continue like this, it is not a good prospect. And it's also important to stress that this impression that this was all but a friendly act and actually also quite unnecessary is shared on the other side of the channel. There was a quite heated debate in the House of Lords on that very same day on the 25th of January, where this move was qualified as petty, um, also as offensive and as gesture politics. So, so you can see that this is actually steering quite some debate. What I would like to do today is to give you briefly some legal details on the background of privileges and immunities, both under international law and also shed light on the relevant parts of the UK framework. Then um, explain how the EU has actually shaped the law and practice regarding its external representation. Thirdly, discuss the EU's evolving stance on the EU's nature and statute. And finally, provide you with some concluding reflections and outlook. So as to the legal background, I'll be brief here and simply recall how privileges and immunities are being conferred under international law. And importantly here, there's a difference to be made between states and international organization IOs. So for the states that you see here in the green box, the reference point in international law is the Vienna Convention Diplomatic Relations of 61. It codifies, or at the time codified um, customary rules, And now we have th this instrument that clearly sets the tone. Two core principles underscore the grant of privileges and also how to maintain diplomatic relations. First, this is based on mutual consent and reciprocity, important. And secondly, the agreement, that means 
the acceptation to have a diplomat on your territory and also the level of protection is a matter of sovereign, sovereign prerogative. We have had this discussion earlier this year, but this is actually something that you cannot impose on a state. The whole state has to agree to this. Now, the mission, the diplomatic mission, is accorded some very important rights. And notably, this is that the premises, the archives, and the correspondence of that mission are inviolable. And then there's a graduated protection of different um, individuals sent by the state to the whole state. And here I will focus on the diplomatic agents, those entrusted with diplomatic functions. They enjoy absolute or full immunity. Concretely, this means that they're actually immune from jurisdiction and execution when it comes to criminal matters, civil matters, and administrative matters. The same cannot necessarily be said for international organizations. Here, we don't have such a universal convention as for states. Sometimes we have an instrument that's specific to the IO. Most of the time, we have bilateral headquarter agreements, and they then regulate the privileges and immunities of that very mission and also of the staff. And while the mission enjoys the same inviolability principles of its premises, archives, and correspondence, there's an important difference, and that is that the immunities and privileges conferred to individuals are of functional nature. That means that they are protected to the extent that they fulfill an act within their function. And that's an important difference between the two. Now, this said, let us now turn to the legal framework in the UK. Regarding states and their envoys, the Vienna Convention was transposed already in 64 and then amended regularly, but that's the core instrument. And that one simply says, this is how state representatives are being um, received in the United Kingdom. In terms of protocol and prestige, it's important to stress here that when you fall under these provisions um, and you take up your functions in London, you have an audience with Her Majesty, so the Queen, and you can also have follow-up follow meetings. For IOs and their staff, again, it's different. You have a variety of acts and headquarter agreements. And in terms of protocol and prestige, interestingly, there's no such audience with the queen foreseen. So you can already see that in terms of prestige, it's not that high. Importantly now for us, the status of the EU is not covered yet by a specific headquarter agreement. It is so far regulated by an amended version of the International Organizations Act of 1968. And the latest amendment came um, at the end of last year. So what I will show to you is now a consolidated version of this very act. I consolidated it myself because it's not yet consolidated on the website of uh, the, the UK authorities, but this is as it reads. And we will not run through all of it, but the important part here is that the EU is now seen as an organization with which the UK has a specific relationship, obviously. And then the second part is important that both the bodies that it establishes and also the personnel it sends can be accorded the privileges and immunities that are deemed appropriate. So what that means is that there's actually some room for maneuver on the British side or the UK side to provide for the full-blown diplomatic immunity or one that is functional only. I also found interesting to discover that there was a new insertion made 3A that you see on the slide, which specifies that according to UK law, the UK can also um, amend provisions that are retained under EU law. And you will see why that might matter in the case that we are dealing with here. So far for this. So just to summarize, in the UK, we have a distinction made obviously between states and IOs, and currently the EU is falling under a more general regime of IOs, but has no specific uh, legal regulation yet. Now, all of this said, let us now turn to how the EU has built bit by bit 
the law and practice regarding its allegations. And you see here this timeline, of course, a simplified one. You don't have to read through all of it. But what you see is that there's actually a long trajectory that started already in the 1950s, when at the time the European coal and steel community opened its first missions abroad in the US and the UK, and when it was still confined to trade and economic issues. But over the years, actually, the portfolio of what these missions do has amplified a lot. So it started with development cooperation in the 60s, with missions also being sent to Africa. And then enlargement became part of this and broader diplomatic talks. And finally, with the creation of the EU and the establishment of the foreign policy and also the security policy, this became also part of the portfolio covered by these at the time community representations and now EU representations. And what is also important to stress here is that since the 1970s, the commission at the time sought diplomatic privileges and immunities for these missions abroad, according to the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. And most of the time, this was actually a successful endeavor. So we have also quite a strong history of these missions having that particular status, the one of a diplomatic mission for the last 40 years or so. Importantly, with the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty, this entire scheme was reshuffled, so to say, and the European External Action Service was created. And here comes something important that I will come back later to. With the creation of the European External Action Service, there was a council decision, as I said, I will mention this in more detail in a minute, that specifically outlines that the missions that the EU henceforth deploys or has deployed and will now continue to maintain should be granted privileges in accordance with the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. This is stated now in EU law. And that's, of course, interesting because that decision at the time was based on unanimity and it echoes provisions of the treaty, which all of you know are also agreed by the representative member states on by unanimity. So this is something that at the time everybody apparently could agree on. Now, what do these missions do? Um, and what is actually their functions and limits. Now, let me first come to the legal setting and status. One part of these delegations, as they're called, EU delegations, are regulated by primary law, Title V of the Treaty on European Union, and more specifically, Article 27.3, which says that the high representative is being assisted by the service and by delegations. And then more precisely, there's this council decision of 2010 that I just mentioned, that explicitly says that the high representative should, when such a delegation is deployed, make sure that I, I cite that host states grant the union delegations their staff and their property privileges and immunities according to those referred to in the Vienna Convention diplomatic relations. So that's important. And then when it comes to international law, the EU has a net of different bilateral treaties with different host states. And again, they also in almost all cases, expressly mention um, that this is based on the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. Interestingly, I mentioned at the beginning that this Diplomatic um, Relations Convention rests on the presumption of mutual agreement and also reciprocity. And for this, there's a triangular situation in place. And actually, it is ensured by Belgium. We will see why that matters in uh, a few minutes. But just for you to explain, so the EU can send a delegation abroad and then the reciprocity is ensured by the delegation or the mission that's opened in Brussels, the representation to the European Union. In terms of affiliation, I will be brief on this, but it's important to stress that they used to be part of the Commission, but this changed with the Lisbon Treaty. And now all of these delegations are actually under the head of the European External Action Service. And the high representative appoints the head of delegation that then actually issues instructions to the delegation staff. So this is now a specific part in, let's say, the EU bureaucracy. As to the core tasks, these missions fulfill actually a lot of diplomatic core tasks. They're engaged in representation of the union and its interests in negotiations, in information exchanges, in the promotion of friendly relations, and to a certain degree, also the protection and interests of, 
um, of the, the member states and the citizens. They do not fulfill classical consular tasks, so they cannot issue travel documents. They will not issue visas. They will not um, provide uh, consular um, assistance or diplomatic protection. It's important to stress. But what that means is that the traditional diplomatic functions are well fulfilled by these delegations, which would in turn warrant diplomatic protection. There's an exception to the consular task, and that is when a member state explicitly asks the delegation to fulfill this because, for instance, it has no representation in the country or for whatever reason, there's also a specific mention made of this in secondary EU law. Now, as for the status quo, when you look at the map, the EU has EU delegations in 143 countries around the world. And here the UK is still in blue, but actually it's more problematic than this. We, we currently don't really know what the status of the EU delegation in the UK is. I'll come back to this in a second. But you can see um, almost all countries of the world have, have um, a delegation of the EU. And importantly, they all grant the EU delegation the status of a diplomatic mission. That means the, the mission of a state in their territory. Now, there's one thing that I want to flag here, and that is that there was a recent incident related to the US where there was apparently unclarity about the status and the status changed. And I would just mention this because I think it's important to put this into perspective to understand maybe also the UK approach. So for a long time, <clears throat> the highest EU envoy was not seen as a state representative, but this changed in 2016. So the EU head of delegation became, so to say, an EU ambassador. And there was an upgrade in the uh, list of the girl diplomatique in Washington. And then there was a downgrade, apparently, in October 2018 under the Trump administration. However, the administration forgot to inform the mission about this. They realized because they stopped being invited to events and the ambassador would not receive uh, official documents anymore. And then the EU inquired and in, indeed, um, at the time, the administration said, yes, it's true. We don't treat this representative as a representative of a state anymore, but as of an IO, and, and we don't give reasons. And even when the EU insisted there was no um, written declaration of why there was this downgrade, in any case, in August 2019, this was again upgraded. So now the head of mission is again seen as an ambassador and figures in the list of the corps diplomatique. Importantly, in this context, the status of the mission members of the mission as such was not put into question. It was about really the head of mission that would, was denied the status of an ambassador. But the protection for those being um, deployed was not put into question. Let me now turn to the situation with the UK. Again, you see here a timeline. And what's important here is that for the matter that we discuss, that when in 2010, the European External Action Service took shape and the council decision was taken, the UK was all in favor of granting EU delegations um, a status in conformity with the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. And there's actually proof of this on the records. And this is also something that's broadly known. And the topic actually never came up again. Also after the Brexit vote, there was this transitory period during which certain EU provisions were still in place. And this was not mentioned either when the withdrawal agreement was negotiated, nor when the currently provisionally applied treaty on trade and uh, sorry, the trade and uh, cooperation agreement was negotiated. So after all of this Brexit limbo, when the UK eventually left the EU at the beginning of the year, the EU was actually quite surprised to learn that the UK would not maintain the practice it had had in the past, namely to support that the EU was maybe not a state, but clearly more than an international organization. And this became public on the 21st of January of this year, when the UK refused to give the new EU head of delegation um, a status in conformity with the Vienna Convention and also did the same for the staff. 
This is what you see in blue on the slide. And the reason given for this, I will come back to this in a second, is that, as I said already in the beginning, this would invite other IOs to go down the same road and to ask for the same privileges and immunities that normally should be reserved to states and state representatives. And the union was, as I said already in the beginning, all but um, amused, and there was actually quite some, um, some fuss made about this in Brussels and press conferences and so on and so forth. The result is that today, I checked again on the website, the EU envoy is not listed in the list of state representatives on the website of the UK Foreign Office. But we don't really know where he is listed and what the status is, as we don't really have a legal basis for this right now. And interestingly, I also checked the UK ambassador to the EU, who was actually appointed also on the 21st of January, so far has not been given its credentials by Belgium. That means that he is so far listed as a chargé d'affaires, but he's not listed as a plénipotentiaire, which means that he has, as an act of reciprocity, also been downgraded to say, well, okay, if you don't recognize this anymore as a state or state-like organization, then your ambassador is not part of the rank of ambassador, but is a chargé d'affaires. Now, as I said previously, the UK advances one single argument for this, and this is the precedent argument. So the EU is not a state. If we do this, everybody comes and will ask for the same. But what that actually implicitly means is that we agreed to the EU being treated as a state diplomatically when we were still part of the club. Now that we have left the club, we have changed our opinion, even though basically the circumstances around have not changed. The EU, in turn, says, well, look at the international practice. All other host states have granted us privileges and immunities according to the Vienna Convention. What is more, the EU is simply more than an IO. It, uh, this is obvious from the level of integration. It, parts of its member states have their own money and so on and so forth. And importantly, something that was not mentioned in the debate, but that I would like to bring up for me, there's also a clear issue of estoppel here. The UK made quite clear and ambiguous in the past that it supported this. It did this on a voluntary basis and created the good faith assumption of the union that this would not change. And shortly after the UK leaving the union, that presumption apparently doesn't hold anymore. Again, as this is a matter of um, sovereign will to grant or not privileges and immunities of a certain level, this argument doesn't really help the union, but I think it is a precedent of a different kind than what the UK actually um, advances, namely that it is a precedent that shows that you cannot really apparently rely on the UK's um, good faith when it comes to maintaining customary rules to which you have subscribed in the past. This said, let me come to my almost final slide, and that is a summary of what we've seen. So again, the UK says, well, the EU, you're not a state, so we grant functional immunity only. And the EU says, well, this is not entirely true, and by the way, this is not how all other states do it. What that leads us with is a clear case of legal limbo. As I told you, we know that the head of delegation of the EU has not been listed in the in the group of corps diplomatique in London. But as there's no new legal basis or no headquarter agreement, we are not really sure what the legal status currently is. At the same time, as I've told you, the EU has probably asked Belgium to downgrade the UK envoy to Brussels or to the EU, who is now only a chargé d'affaires. And the website of the UK is silent about this, but when you read the press, you will clearly find out that the EU has also refused to receive him and to actually make sure that he has his credentials to start working. So he's also in a limbo because he cannot exercise his full functions. And I would like to conclude with a statement that was made by Baroness Hooper in this heated debate I mentioned in the introduction in the House of Lords, 
where she depicts this act of the UK as something that is actually quite offensive, not only to the EU authorities and other member states, but also to Portugal, our oldest ally since the ambassador, to whom the UK refused to give these state-like credentials as a Portuguese diplomat. And she asked the question, can my noble friend also give us a concrete example of what benefit this unnecessary action will bring this country? And reading all of the UK statements on the matter, I can assure you that I don't really find any benefit the UK has advanced so far, be this legal or diplomatic, to this change of status. And I'm very much looking forward to your points of view on the matter and how you believe this issue can maybe be resolved. Thank you very much.